Welcome to LSE for this online event hosted by the Department of International Relations, the Phelan United States Center and the Religion and Global Society Research Unit. My name is James Walters and I am director of that research unit and a senior lecturer in practice in the Department of International Relations. We've just seen the G7 summit in Cornwall and Joe Biden's first visit as American president to the UK. As part of that, he and the Prime Minister Boris Johnson signed a new Atlantic Charter to deepen cooperation between our countries. And many may have been surprised to read in its opening paragraph, a joint commitment to protecting freedom of religion or belief around the world. A surprise because while this human right was stated as Article 18 of the Universal Declaration in the 1940s, it's only really recently come to prominence in human rights discourse. And a surprise also perhaps as it came to the fore under the previous American administration with whom it's fair to say the continuities are limited. So tonight we're interested in exploring the future of religious freedom as a foreign policy agenda of the United States government and by extension within global discourse around religion and human rights as it enters this new phase in the post-Trump era. To do that, we have an exceptional panel and I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Jard Birdsell, Dr. Courtney Freer and Dr. H.A. Hellier from around the world to our discussion today. Jad is a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs at Georgetown University. He has previously served in the US State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom and on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff. Courtney is an assistant professorial research fellow uh, at the LSE Middle East Center and a non-resident fellow in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings Institute. She's also an affiliated faculty member in LSE Religion and Global Society. Hisham is a Carnegie Endowment Scholar, a fellow of Cambridge University's Center for Islamic Studies and a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. He's a prolific public intellectual writing on governance, international relations, security, and religion in the West and in the Arab world. For those uh, Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Forb, F-O-R-B. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast, subject to there being no technical difficulties. As usual with LSE events, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to the panel. And to submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be submitted to me and I'll pose as many as possible to the speakers. Please let us know your name and any relevant affiliation. We're particularly keen to hear from our students and alumni, so please let us know. But now uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Judd Burtzel. Judd. Great. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much, Jim, for the kind introduction and the invitation to be here as a part of this webinar. Uh, thanks so much to your colleagues um, at the LSE US Center and the Faith Center for putting on this webinar and for all the excellent work uh, that you do. Uh, what I would like to do in my initial remarks uh, today is uh, three things. Uh, first, I'll offer just a few quick thoughts on why I think this um, topic is so important and relevant right now, building a bit on what uh, Jim has just uh, said, and then uh, offer a bit of history in terms of how we got here with all of this foreign policy infrastructure and also foreign policy debates surrounding uh, religious freedom. And then finally, I'll offer a few uh, initial observations uh, as to how the Biden administration is uh, reshaping America's promotion of religious freedom uh, globally. Uh, so first, why is the issue important and relevant? Uh, a number of things can, can be said, of course, but uh, let me just highlight uh, three reasons that uh, stick out in my mind. Uh, and those are the, the severity of, of the problem, the scale now of the response, uh, and the seriousness of the debates that now surround the governmental response to uh, religious freedom issues. Uh, so first, in terms of, of severity, 
religious persecution, discrimination, um, hostilities based on religious uh, affiliation are um, enormous problems uh, around the world. Hundreds of millions of people suffer uh, to varying degrees on account of their, their beliefs and their, their affiliations. All of the recent uh, quantitative and qualitative reports on the issue find a number of worrying trends. And during the past year plus of the COVID pandemic, um, while restrictions on religious gatherings are of course in principle justifiable on public health grounds, we've also seen how the pandemic and lockdowns have exacerbated a number of, of troubling trends, the scapegoating of different minority uh, religious communities uh, in some places. Uh, so we have a major global problem uh, on our hands. Uh, in response to it, um, many governments, not just the United States, but also Canada, the UK, many European states, as well as the EU, the OSCE, the UN, and others, uh, have in recent years created um, new units, new offices, new envoys, new funding mechanisms devoted to the promotion of religious freedom uh, around the world. Um, uh, and now this is now an increasingly uh, salient dimension of many foreign policies uh, and increasingly of, of multilateral uh, collaboration. Uh, as Jim, as you just mentioned, um, this was raised at the, at the G7 level. I think largely it's the UK that's, that's helping to raise the profile of the issue. And it, there is a, a reference to freedom of religion or belief in, um, in the communique coming out of the, uh, the Cornwall summit as well. So uh, a lot of attention to this issue now. Uh, and along with that attention, a lot of debate around um, uh, how a number of international issues now get framed as religious freedom issues. So if there's a conflict or a court case or whatever it might be that has some religious dimension, and just about everything in life has some sort of religious dimension, those are increasingly framed as religious freedom issues, uh, because that's a way to uh, mobilize certain constituencies, to um, exert political pressure, uh, and, and to leverage the existing foreign policy infrastructure that, that uh, exists uh, with respect to uh, the promotion of religious freedom. So a number of other um, uh, things could, could be said on that front, but let me turn to history and talk a little bit about how we got here uh, in terms of uh, all this infrastructure and all of this uh, debate. Uh, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves that it hasn't always been this way. We haven't always had this infrastructure. We haven't always had these debates and these, uh, these polarizing discussions around uh, religious freedom. Um, just as the famous God gap in American politics, this, this tight linkage between religiosity and partisan affiliation uh, is, is only actually a, a relatively recent uh, development. Uh, so polarization around religious freedom is, uh, is uh, even more recent. We didn't see the God gap in American life until really the 1970s. And if you go back just to the 1990s, uh, you, you would find broad consensus around the role of religious freedom uh, in foreign policy. Uh, back in the mid to late 1990s, it was a very broad coalition of religious and faith-based groups that came together to support what ultimately became the International Religious Freedom Act of uh, 1998. Religious freedom is often um, portrayed as sort of an evangelical Protestant issue, but the coalition uh, back in the 90s was evangelical groups, liberal Protestant groups, Catholic groups, Jewish groups, Buddhists, Baha'is, uh, groups across the theological and ideological spectrum coming together uh, to support that legislation. And that act actually passed uh, the US Senate unanimously and now in this era of, of hyper partisanship and gridlock in Congress, the idea of any legislation passing unanimously, let alone one dealing with religion, uh, almost seems mythological. But that, that's where we were just 20 plus years ago when it came to the, uh, the act that created the State Department office where I uh, previously served, created the ambassador for religious freedom, created um, the requirement to uh, produce an annual report on every country. Um, and um, uh, created a, an independent U.S. commission devoted to promotion of religious freedom. Um, but even back then, there were some initial indications that this could become a contentious issue. Uh, there were voices in the Clinton administration that worried that the act would create a so-called hierarchy of, of human rights, that by endowing one human right with its own office, its own ambassador, its own report, there was the, going to be the creation of some sort of, uh, of, of hierarchy. Then during the 
Um, the Bush administration, you had President Bush talking about uh, religious freedom as the first freedom of the human soul, uh, a seeming endorsement of this idea of a hierarchy with religious freedom, um, perhaps perhaps not at the, at the very top, but, but at the bottom in terms of being the most foundational, the most fundamental, perhaps the most uh, consequential and thus requiring a certain level of, of prioritization. And the office, the Religious Freedom Office grew quite significantly uh, in terms of staff and, and resources during uh, the Bush years. Then during the Obama years, the, that growth largely plateaued and there was a, a renewed emphasis on uh, integrating and situating religious freedom within a broader uh, human rights framework, both conceptually and, and bureaucratically. Uh, also a, an attention to uh, a, a broader engagement with religious and faith-based groups uh, across the full range of foreign policy issues. Uh, given that religious groups don't just care about religious freedom, they also care about uh, the environment, uh, education, corruption, full range of, of uh, cultural and social and, and political and economic uh, issues. And so in 2013, the State Department created the Office of Religion and Global Affairs. Uh, and at one point, 2015, 16, there were over 50 staff, I believe, working in either of those uh, two offices, religion and global affairs or uh, international religious freedom. Uh, then with the Trump administration during the past four years, as, as Jim has already uh, indicated, a massive attention to religious freedom. Uh, there was an executive order that called on the, the federal government to prioritize the issue. There was new funding. There were ministerial, high-level, high-profile gatherings on the issue that led to the creation of a new international alliance on freedom of religion. Um, in 2020, then Secretary of, of, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo uh, boasted that the Trump administration had, for the first time in American history, made religious freedom uh, a top foreign policy priority. And this prioritization uh, won a lot of praise from certain uh, audiences, especially Trump's base, of course, but also raised a lot of concern uh, that it was disproportionate or perhaps disingenuous or, or driven more by uh, domestic uh, political considerations than it was for any genuine um, uh, concern for international uh, human rights. Uh, and then that brings us up to the, the Biden administration, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. So basically over the, over the past 20 years, you've seen um, growing attention overall to the issue of religious freedom in foreign policy, as well as a growing divide between those that we might call the, the first freedom crowd and those who are concerned about this um, uh, hierarchy of human rights, who are happy to talk about religious freedom as Article 18, situated within a, a broad range of, of, of human rights. And I should say by way of, of caveat that we often uh, focus our attention on what Trump or Biden or Bush or Obama says or does, uh, but we need to be reminded that at the ground level, the day-to-day -day work of American diplomats in Washington and in embassies and consulates around the world remains pretty much the same. Uh, engaging with religious and belief groups, uh, raising concerns with host governments, and then producing what is uh, by far the world's most comprehensive, most reliable report on religious freedom in every country. Uh, so how is the Biden administration reshaping uh, religious freedom policy globally? I think it's still a bit early to say how it will do this in terms of policy and, and bureaucracy, but because uh, we're still waiting on uh, the arrival of um, some senior officials, including the nomination of an ambassador at large for religious freedom. But there are two areas in which we can already see uh, uh, some key shifts with respect to religious freedom uh, and in foreign policy. And those are um, uh, rhetorically and conceptually. So rhetorically, the Biden team has uh, replaced what I would consider the, the bravado and bombast of the Trump years um, with a much greater degree of, of humility, modesty, uh, and self-awareness when it comes to talking about religious freedom uh, in the world. Um, when he released, um, his final religious freedom report, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said, America cares more about religious freedom than any country in the world, and America is the greatest nation in the history of civilization, uh, which may play well to certain domestic audiences, but doesn't really resonate uh, with an international audience that you're trying to convince of uh, the value of religious freedom. Uh, by contrast, when now Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken uh, released the most recent 
um, Religious Freedom Report, he talked about how anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim uh, sentiment are uh, growing and serious problems in the United States uh, as, as well as in Europe. Um, and I think that sort of self-awareness, that modesty uh, goes a long way in terms of uh, rebuilding some of the credibility of the United States around this issue. For, for four years, there was this jarring uh, hypocrisy between so much attention on religious freedom on the one hand and on the other talk of banning Muslims and slashing the number of refugees allowed to resettle people who actually fleeing religious persecution uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, and then also uh, conceptually, the Biden team, uh, like the Clinton team, the Obama team, has this concern about a hierarchy of human rights, is not using the language of the first freedom, uh, but talking in terms of how uh, religious freedom uh, and all other human rights are co-equal, interdependent, uh, and indivisible. And I think at a, at a practical level, um, uh, this approach um, has the benefit of, of being uh, much less likely to be seen as something that's disproportionate, as something that's um, partisan or sectarian. Um, but the the uh, practical challenge, though, is that because there was so much prioritization on religious freedom during the Trump years, that anything less than a, making it a top priority could look like a demotion of the issue. So the ongoing challenge for the, the Biden team will be to uh, demonstrate in word and in deed that um, promoting religious freedom as, a, as, the full, as part of the whole package of human rights is a more effective uh, strategy. Well, I will uh, leave it at that and uh, turn it back over to you, Jim. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judd, for that fantastic uh, overview to kick us off. Um, now, Courtney, over to you. Great, thank you so much. And thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm gonna touch on some of the same points that, that Judd made about the difference between this administration and the last one. But there are two main conceptual points I wanna touch on. Um, the first, I think it's worth noting when we talk about religious freedom, it's important to consider first religious freedom for whom and is in what jurisdiction, as well as to what extent this definition varies from administration to administration. Um, I think there, as, as Judd mentioned, there was a widespread feeling that the Trump administration, though it gave a lot of funding and a lot of lip service to the importance of religious freedom, um, had held as its priority a, a pretty narrow segment of the Christian population. I think in particular, it, President Trump's response in 2017 to the now infamous uh, rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, where anti-Semitic and racist uh, you know, uh, slogans were used. Um, after which President Trump uh, famously proclaimed that the protesters included, in his words, some very fine people, in which he placed blame for violence on both sides. I think this really was seen as cementing Trump's interest in religious freedom as being quite narrow um, and, and catering to this evangelical base uh, and, and therefore being more of an issue related to domestic politics than necessarily to his foreign policy. Um, and indeed, under Trump's tenure, we have seen the beginning of this trend, which unfortunately is ongoing of, of anti-Semitic attacks in the US. We've seen this in the UK and Europe as well, um, especially in the past year. Uh, and I think throughout all of this, President Trump continued, of course, talking about the importance of religious freedom and also using symbols of Christianity when he was, was trying to make political points. Um, I think most salient was Trump's uh, photo op kind of in front of St. John's Episcopal Church uh, last summer in DC, which was a clear attempt, I think, to co-opt the symbols of Christianity, using a Bible, standing in front of a church, uh, I guess holding a Bible, standing in front of a church as a means of speaking to an evangelical base before then clearing Lafayette Square of protesters. And I think it's really interesting to show that the link between church and state definitely persists, even when we as, as Americans uh, criticize links between religion and politics in other parts of the world. So again, when we talk about religious freedom, who are we talking about it for? And to what extent does it cover political freedom as well? And I think considering some of the baggage of the Trump era, which I mentioned and which Judd mentioned as well, when it comes to domestic concerns about religious freedom as a candidate, um, Joe Biden promoted a plan which talked a lot about inclusivity and the need to, in his words, safeguard our nation's religious communities. So this was very much a, a reaction against what many saw as Trump's narrow but intense concerns when it came to religious freedom. Um, as president, Joe Biden has announced his respect for what he calls our cherished guarantees of church state separation and freedom for people of all faiths and none. Um, notably on, on Biden's website, he talks a lot about um, the rise in anti-Semitic and Islamophobic attacks in the US in particular. Um, he also identifies when it comes to domestic religious freedom, 
three areas in which he wants to promote religious freedom uh, in the US. So one is providing more security grants to religious communities through the Department of Homeland Security's uh, grant program. The second is establishing what he calls a faith-based law enforcement program, which I think is a really fascinating idea, though I'm, I'm unsure how it would work. Um, and the third is strengthening prosecutions of hate crimes, since these do seem to be um, on the rise over the past few years. I think all of these steps demonstrate a commitment, not necessarily to this, this idea of separation of church and state, but at least to using domestic instruments to ensure the safety of the, uh, the diversity of, of the US's relig religious communities, which is a, a, a sea change, I think, from, from what we saw under the Trump administration. Although Trump did give a lot of rhetorical signals about the importance of, and, and a lot of funding, the importance of religious freedom. What I think is um, particularly interesting and maybe a more notable point of departure is examining where religious freedom influences or should influence American foreign policy under Joe Biden. Um, indeed, as, as Judd mentioned again, Biden did take the step of repealing Trump's so-called Muslim ban on immigration, which was a 2017 executive order that prevented foreign nationals from seven Muslim majority states from entering the US. Um, Biden has also hosted a meeting with more than 20 Muslim organizations and has widened the path for refugees, including religious refugees, to seek sanctuary in the US, in addition to declaring China's treatment of its weaker Muslim population a genocide. Um, still, the US disproportionately applies uh, to people from Muslim majority states a, a vetting process that is aimed at preventing immigrants perceived to be national security threats from becoming citizens. Um, there's still a lot more surveillance uh, placed on Muslim communities in the US than other religious communities. Um, and so despite the fact that the Muslim ban has changed how, US, how the US is, is kind of viewing international Muslim communities, there's still a concern that about how the, what the effect will be domestically and whether there needs to be a sea change at the kind of a grassroots level in addition to at the foreign policy level. Um, another issue that's come up more, more recently is in May, President Biden put out a pretty strong statement about the rise of anti-Semitic attacks in the US, which of course happened in concert with the, the latest round of violence in Gaza. Um, the Anti-Defamation League has talked a lot about the, this latest spike in attack and anti-Semitic attacks and anti-Semitism more broadly, and has described the shift as both quantitative in terms of there's a higher number of attacks happening and qualitative in terms of there being more brazen and more direct than, than attacks on, on America's Jewish populations in the past. Um, I think it's really interesting to note that these attacks have increased a, a, when we have a, an administration that's calling out the importance of stopping such attacks and is, is using language, to, strong language to condemn these attacks, which does kind of bear, bring to mind, you know, the, or leads me to question, I mean, how much does the administration actually influence what's happening on the ground? How much does rhetoric from the administration uh, influence the way that religious minorities are treated in the US? And I think that's worth considering. And, and secondly, I think it also shows the extent to which people of a certain religious faith are expected, and this is not just in the American context, um, to support specific foreign policies. For instance, all, all of the Jewish population is expected to support Israel, and this is the presumption on which many of these anti-Semitic attacks, in not just in the US, um, were, were based. And when it comes to, I guess, specifically foreign policy considerations under Biden, um, Judd did mention uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's statements on the release of the International Religious Freedom Report. And I think it's it's interesting to note that the US does put out this report um, because it does kind of place the US as in this position as a, a judge of, of religious freedom. And it is a fantastic resource, but it is interesting that, that this is something where the US has placed a lot of resources for over the past 23 years. And on the event of the, the release of that report, one thing that Blinken said that, that I seized on in particular was that in his view, the Trump administration had placed an unbalanced emphasis on religious liberty at the expense of other concerns. And in his words, and this is a direct quote, uh, religious freedom, like every human right, is universal. All people everywhere are entitled to it, no matter where they live, what they believe, or what they don't believe. Religious freedom is co-equal with other human rights because human rights are indivisible. And this is the point that Judd made, that essentially this idea that there is a hierarchy of different human rights is, is being scrapped under the Biden administration. There's basically, it, it's a very logical to think that all of these human rights are linked to one another. Um, and I, th I think it is too early to tell, for instance, where considerations about religious freedom should be placed when we think about how the US under Biden approaches states like Myanmar, Russia, Nigeria, China, where, where religious minorities are, are persecuted. Um, to what extent is treatment towards these states tempered by concerns about religious freedom or about realpolitik? 
Um, and also, do we have different foreign policies for states with different religions? I think that audience matters. And, and I think it'll be interesting to see the extent to which this, this kind of deprioritization of, of religious freedom uh, has an impact on foreign policy moving forward. Um, a second point, a conceptual point I wanted to make um, just briefly is a, another consideration that I think is worth talking about is about freedom of religion versus freedom of religious politics. So in a country where a separation of church and state remains legally enshrined, despite the fact that this country houses a, a large evangelical movement, religion undoubtedly remains a, a political tool both domestically and, and internationally as well. Um, under the Trump administration, one issue that came up and then affected my work in particular was the discussion of politics and religion, especially Islam and politics. Um, of course, and I think this is worth pointing out, there's a distinction between Islam and Islamists, just as there is between Christians and evangelical um, parts of the, the political evangelical movement in the US. Um, but I think it's striking to see how much of what seem to be proclamations about religious freedom at home actually do have definite foreign policy corollaries. And at least under Trump, it seemed that American concern for religious freedom may have stopped when religion became politically problematic, uh, either for the US or for its strategic allies. Um, and, and just to give an example that was related to, to my work in particular, there was renewed interest under the Trump administration, and this has kind of come up in the past few years and may come up again, um, in designating the Muslim Brotherhood as a foreign terrorist organization, I think reflected not really any uptick in domestic Islamist activity in the US or elsewhere, but this strengthened alliance between Trump on one side and uh, the Egyptian, Saudi, and Emirati leaderships, all of whom for their own political reasons wanted to and in fact did ban the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, discussions about political Islam that followed, in my view, tended to conflate political Islam with violence. Um, and I think that has some dangerous imp implications for religious freedom. Um, for instance, the UAE's list of terrorist organizations, which it released in 2014, included advocacy groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations. And so we have this very narrow distinction between what is religious freedom and where does that cross into politics and where does that cross into advocacy in a way that, that makes either the US or other governments uncomfortable. Um, and this is a discussion that we've had in the UK as well with the political Islam inquiry. Um, and so I think it's it will be interesting to see how the Biden administration handles this distinction, especially given that its rhetoric makes the, makes the claim that human rights are all equal. So religious freedom must exist with political freedom. So what happens when that isn't the case, when religion religious freedom is okay, unless it becomes a, a politicized type of religion. Um, and I think we see another, and, and this is the last point I'll make is, is we, we hear a lot of these discussions, particularly I think from the Saudi and Emirati leaderships about moderate Islam. Um, as opposed to, I suppose, political Islam. And I think, I think it's interesting to think about why Islam needs to be modified, um, because we never really talk about moderate Christianity or moderate Judaism, though perhaps, perhaps we should. But I think the fact that that modifier has been used more and more suggests that there is a concern about the religion in and of itself being more political or less moderate in, in some way. Um, and again, I think this begs the question of where religious freedom ends and political freedom begins, um, especially when you're, you're saying that all of these rights have equal importance under the Biden administration. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop there. So thank you. That's certainly given us lots to chew over. Thanks so much, Courtney. Uh, Hisham. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim, um, and thank you to my previous panelists, uh, Jen and Courtney, uh, a lot to chew on then, and good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to have been invited to speak at the LSE this evening to discuss, I think, a very important topic, one that becomes more and more important as time goes on, as the incidents of infringements upon religious freedom itself become ever more common. And it's a topic that I have personally followed from two angles um uh, personally which i hope to briefly elaborate elaborate upon this evening the first is how the topic of religious freedom domestically within the uk within the us and the west more generally is often sorely ignored in public conversations um the second is on frankly the abuse of the topic of religious freedom when engaged on in the international arena by our governments in the west with regards to governments elsewhere um on on the first point, when we generally talk about international religious freedom, it's rare indeed we're referring to within the West. It's something that I think is actually uh, quite new to the scale that we've been doing more recently. Um, 
And I think we've got to start talking about it far more bluntly, but also not simply noting it as a problem, but also making the connections. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, we're now in a post-Trump era with the onset of the Biden administration. That's true. It's true that the Trump administration was perhaps one of the most latent sources of anti-Muslim bigotry that was alluded to by our previous panelists. Uh, but the departure of that administration does not mean that anti-Muslim bigotry in our societies has ended. A little over a week ago, we saw four Muslims in Canada murdered all at once by a far-right extremist for literally no other reason other than they were Muslim. And there are three points that I made in the aftermath of that quite gruesome attack um, that I wanted to repeat here this evening. The first is that while we are ever more, thankfully, aware of the threat of the far right in our societies, we often underestimate the effect that this has on religious freedom in our societies more particularly, because anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia are outsized components of what constitutes far right ideology. So that's the first point with regards to that. The second is that the ideological connections when it comes to that particular phenomenon are not limited to one country, but rather they exist across borders. They're international. They don't act simply as isolated local ideas. And finally, and perhaps most crucially, the, the rhetoric of the far right today, including anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia, thrives, indeed it survives, because so much of it has been mainstreamed by politicians and influential figures in the public arena. And all of that needs to be included in our broader conversations around religious freedom. The second point I wanted to note is how religious freedom issues internationally when discussed by Western actors internationally can be sorely misused. And we had a, a crucial example of this in the UK a couple of years ago, where our foreign secretary at the time released a report he'd commissioned on the persecution of Christians worldwide. And it was frankly quite a peculiar project from the get go. If we're looking at persecuted religious communities worldwide, it isn't the Christian community that is frankly most in need of it. It's the Yazidis in Iraq, or it's the Rohingya in Myanmar, or Muslim groups in China. These are clearly under far more pressure to say the least as the unanimous agreement of human rights institutions worldwide testify. But as my colleague at the time, Zia Morao pointed out, those pushing for the adoption of such discourse vis-a-vis -vis the threat posed to Christian communities worldwide under the rubric of concerns uh, with regards to religious freedom are often motivated as much by anti-Islamic prejudice as by concerns about persecution per se. And that the use of such language possibly does very little except contribute to the deepening of myths around clashes of civilizations. And it comes at a cost. All too often in my own work, particularly with regards to the Arab world, I've seen advocates in the religious freedom arena internationally use those concerns around religious freedom, which are very legitimate concerns, to then advocate the backing of authoritarians in the wider Arab world region. These advocates who are very often deeply ideological identitarian advocates who see Christian communities in these authoritarian states as uniquely deserving of protection over and above other communities in those same states will mix their calls for concern around those communities, about those communities with calls for alignments with dictators and autocrats in the region on the basis that they quote unquote defend Christians. But the reality is, as you know, Judd pointed out earlier on in this evening, the future of Christians in the Arab world and the wider region cannot be done independently from addressing the challenges facing the region as a whole. Indeed, in the report that, uh, that I mentioned, uh, commissioned by the FSO, there was an, an interview with a Syrian bishop that made this point very well. He revealed how a European official had asked him how the international community could protect Christians in Syria. And he replied that they should work to protect all Syrians, not only the Christians. And this reaction might be idealistic, but it's also very rational because the bishop knows as an indigenous Arab Christian that the future of the Christian minority in Syria is intertwined with the future of the Muslim majority as all Syrians. But when it comes convenient 
to back authoritarian autocrats abroad for a whole slew of reasons. Religious minorities, unfortunately, become useful and sentimental pawns to buttress such backing. And that's something that I think our own diplomats, be they in the foreign office in the UK or in the State Department in the US, know extremely well, because our own officials on the ground in embassies around the world tell them that themselves. They know that when we as Westerners do embark on using that type of language that exceptionalizes certain communities over others in ways that are not justifiable, those communities themselves express the concern that such strategies can even serve to fuel extremist discourse, where extremists will use just calls for solidarity as evidence that these minorities are not actually integral to the region at all, but are rather Western plants or proxies. Now, it isn't that there aren't any concerns to be had around Christian minority communities or indeed other communities that could be mentioned in the context of religious freedom. And other colleagues such as uh, George's Fatmi at uh, Chatham House has brought that up. Indeed, human rights organizations within these different countries from the region of the region, as opposed to lobbyists from outside of the region, they often raise those concerns very justifiably all the time. And as people like that, we ought to be taking our cues from. But they often say things that, alas, we find uncomfortable to hear in these discussions. So we may say from London or from DC, we're worried about the future of the Christian population of the Holy Land. Uh, and Christian activists from the Holy Land and human rights activists therein will tell us there's no way to understand what's happening to that community without raising the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. We might find that actually Bashar al-Assad of Syria isn't actually some kind of defender of an ancient civilization, as a Daily Mail columnist put it a few years ago, and so on, and so on. Rather, we need to know very clearly that occupations are bad for everyone, authoritarianism is bad for everyone, autocracy is bad, for everyone, even if in the short term we find Machiavellian excuses to throw so many of our principles around fundamental rights and freedoms under the bus. I'm about to wrap up, but I do want to say there's a lot more we can discuss on this topic, and I'm looking forward to the discussion, including those arenas where religious freedom advocates in the West are indeed able to make headway, such as on the Uyghur population in China, which is frankly one of the most egregious examples of religious persecution we've seen in decades. But it's also clear that for far too many of our policymakers, there's talking the talk, but there's no walking the walk. Look at how, for example, the Biden administration tried to put out a pretty harsh statement on China a few days ago because of the Uyghurs over the, uh, during the last G7 uh, summit. And the European response represented the same summit was pretty lukewarm. Indeed, even among pretty much every Muslim majority nation worldwide, the calling out of China on particularly this issue has frankly been abysmal because alas, money talks. With that, I thank you for your patience and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Hisham. And I think to, to get our conversation going, um, just first as a, as a panel, I think I wanna pick up on uh, some of the things you've been alluding to Hisham and, and, and Courtney as well, I think. Um, it, to, to kind of just sort of scroll back a bit and and challenge some of the assumptions around four. But I think, um, you know, many of my colleagues at the LSE and um, perhaps, uh, you know, other, let's, you know, say Western liberal thinkers are really of the opinion that a discussion about religious freedom is kind of most often unhelpful, that the kinds of human rights violations that we're talking about are better understood as linked to uh, ethnicity or related to nationalism and authoritarianism or race or whatever, and that framing these um, challenges through this freedom of religion lens is in itself to kind of fuel uh, a sort of, well, I guess the kind of clash of, clash of civilizations uh, narrative that is associated with populist leaders like Donald Trump. And I think that's some of the suspicion around um, this agenda among um, uh, certainly a lot of my colleagues and more sort of left-leaning liberals. So I wonder, I mean, I get a sense that some of our panel have some sympathy with that view um, and uh, maybe others don't, but I, I'm just curious to know, wh when is it helpful for religion to be the lens here? Uh, and how do we discern that? Can, can I take a, a, a crack at that, Jim? So um, 
uh, I get the sense that you thought that I might be against that framing. I'm actually not against that framing at all. I think that in many cases, there are issues around religious freedom that are specifically about religious freedom. My issue is then how they are framed. And one of the things that I've noticed tremendously over the past sort of 10 years, and, and here I'm thinking particularly around the Arab Spring, post-Arab Spring sort of era, is that these concerns around religious freedom will be brought up for mainly countries in the Middle East I'm talking about here, but they won't link to groups on the ground that actually are dealing with these issues and framing them accordingly. So you will find human rights organizations in places like Egypt, like the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights or the Current Institute for Human Rights Studies. Um, and they also do work in other countries as well, like Tunisia and other parts of the Arab world. They will talk about specifically religious freedom issues, and they will do so with great justification because they are issues that come under that rubric of religious freedom. But you'll never see them frame it as some sort of excuse to A, back authoritarians or autocrats, nor to uh, create this sort of clash of civilizations idea. Um, they will do, I think, a, a bang up job actually of correctly identifying where there are laws or uh, norms or protocols uh, that penalize and so on. But they will do it, and I think, in a very precise sort of fashion. And one of the main issues I had with that report that I mentioned from the FCO is that it didn't seem to have any connection to groups on the ground at all. It had everything to do with agendas that were built in London uh, about London, you know. Um, and I've seen the same thing, unfortunately, um, among you know sort of solidarity groups that are in the United States as well. So it's not that there aren't religious freedom issues that we need to be concerned about. I think there are. Uh, I don't think that they're always about ethnicity uh, or about class. I do think that those play a massive role. Okay. Um, and even when it comes to religious uh, religious uh, freedom issues as well, because um, it's, it's very rare that you find people uh, uh, discriminating against somebody who's incredibly rich and wealthy, irrespective of what religion they actually happen to have, because, you know, money talks. Um, but it's about the framing of it that I think is incredibly important. Thanks, Hisham. And if I could add, I think I think one one argument that I've heard in the States in particular about framing uh, around religious freedom and, about, and around religion in general is that not all religious beliefs are are socially liberal. So there are a lot of there are a lot of concerns, for instance, for protections of LGBTQ communities, of women's rights. I mean, there's a lot of uh, issues. You know, if you allow religious freedom for everyone, a lot of times illiberal social policies are going to be be allowed to be advocated for. And so I think that allowing religious freedom, allowing political, just like allowing religious, political freedom and religious freedom, sorry, got mixed up. Um, essentially, it means that people will be able to advocate for views which are not necessarily socially liberal, are not necessarily popular even, but but it's still part of, of the rubric of allowing religious freedom, which which co needs to coexist with political freedom as well more broadly. But, but it doesn't mean that it will necessarily be liberal. And I think that that's kind of part of the framing when you bring in religion is that there's a fear that it will be authoritarian or it will be backwards in some ways. And and, and some some uh, social policies in particular that are advocated by religious groups are, 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 are illiberal. Um, so yeah. John. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely resonate with those concerns around framing as well. And I mentioned in my remarks that uh, if you look hard enough, just about any inter international issue has some sort of religion dimension to it. And often to get attention for that issue, uh, certain activists will leverage uh, religious freedom or whatever their, the issue might be, um, even though the issue, the conflict uh, itself might, uh, is, is likely to be enormously complex and involve issues of uh, of ethnicity and race and gender and resource competition and geography and a whole range of things. Uh, but when you go to the foreign office or the State Department, uh, there's no office for deeply complex embedded social issues around the world. There's the Office of Religious Freedom, the Office of Human Trafficking, the Office of Global Women's, I mean, all, all these sort of discrete issues, um, which in and of themselves are insufficient lenses. If you just go with one, you'll have an insufficient diagnosis and an insufficient uh, then, then, um, solution. And, and often uh, senior officials or politicians will grab on to one of those framings or one of those diagnoses, uh, I think in an, in an unhelpful way. Uh, whereas those uh, diplomats and analysts and think tank types on the ground will have a, a much more nuanced um, uh, 
um, embedded view, nested view of, of these issues. One of the things that we talk about in some of the networks I'm involved in is uh, right-sizing religion, or in this case, also right-sizing religious freedom, and making sure that it's, it's, it's um, taken as part of the analysis, but um, it's not neglected, but also it doesn't sort of trump other uh, analytical factors or uh, uh, methods of engaging a particular situation. Thank you. Well, uh, we've got questions uh, flooding in, and um, I want to kick off with this um, very pertinent question from Arshed Elia, who is an alumna of um, uh, alumni of Washington, George Washington University, who asked basically about what what direction should G seven governments follow with regards to religious freedom and highlights here all the different uh, situations we're facing in China, Myanmar, India, Egypt, and so on. Um, can, can sanctions help? And should there be more emphasis on calling out barbaric acts as genocide? And I, uh, this question really resonates with me because I feel like I've sat in numerous kind of four uh, events and, and forum where there's a great deal of hand wringing. Um, but even kind of at quite senior levels, we struggle to work out what an effective uh, FORB intervention looks like. So I think it's a very good question to, to kick off. Who wants to pick it up? Hisham, go for it. Uh, so the, I don't think there's one size fits all on this. Um, and I'm not saying this on a moral level. On a moral level, I think, of course, we should do whatever we can do in order to ensure that people's fundamental freedoms are protected. Um, and, you know, religious freedom is one of those. Um, I say on a tactical level, uh, it can get a little bit complicated about how we express that. And I think about this a lot because of how uh, countries such as the US or the UK or the European Union, um, as the European Union often deal with autocratic regimes and have no choice but to deal with them um, because of various other things that are happening on any given day. Um, and then because of that no choice sort of issue, um, they sort of throw their hands up in the air and says, well, there's nothing we can do. So, you know, we just need to get on with it. Um, and then there'll be certain cases that will come up that they'll want to make interventions on uh, in order to help people uh, that need help. And it becomes very difficult to come up with a one size fits all kind of thing. If you intervene in the wrong way, then you make that community or individual for that matter, a target, okay? Where you, uh, you basically draw attention to them uh, in a way that they don't need that attention, that they don't want that attention um, because it actually creates more problems from, for them than it solves. And then in other cases, that's not the issue at all. It's simply that we're being cowardly, if I can be frank, that we simply don't really think that this is important enough as compared to um, the, the arms deals that we have or the business and trade links that we have and so on and so on and so on. Um, so I do think that it's a question of, are we able to really put hand on heart and say, we have proper networks on the ground, knowing the situation properly, what sort of assistance is going to be valid and effective? What sort of assistance is going to be counterproductive? Or are we simply coming at this at you know some sort of ideological lens that makes a lot of sense with our enemies at home, i.e. that we can sort of push back against the left, that we can push back against the right, but the left and right within our own cities. So, you know, it's it's very often, unfortunately, that discussions around Syria and Washington, D.C. are all about Washington, D.C. and have nothing to do with Syria, that discussions around uh, any number of countries in the region, they're all about D.C. Um, and it's about, you know, fighting uh, between different camps in D.C. on these sorts of issues. So uh, I think we have to be very honest about that and consider uh, in different places what's going to be most useful to those communities on the ground. Thank you. Jod. Yeah, uh, two things uh, to, to mention there. One is that uh, we're dealing with generational challenges here, things that take decades, often decades or centuries to work out. We think back on, on British history, um, 
you know, it's anachronistic to say it, but, um, you know, the United Kingdom um, could have been labeled a country of particular concern by the U.S. State Department for religious persecution, uh, given the treatment of, of non-Anglicans back in whatever uh, century. Uh, these things can take a long, long time to, to, to work themselves out. Um, of course, the U.K. is now a vibrant, pluralistic, uh, li liberal democracy. Um, and likewise, in the U.S., uh, a number of things in our past and still in our present that, you um, uh, just take a long time to, 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 to work through. Uh, so I think there, there needs to be some degree of, of, of patience and, and, and perspective there. People often ask, why hasn't the U.S. accomplished more for religious freedom in the last 20 years or the U.K. or whatever in the last few years? Um, these things take a long time. They're enormously complex, as we've already uh, touched on. And then just building on what um, Dr. Hellier just said in terms of um, having a, a, a flexible approach. Sometimes the, the critique is made, um, why does the US you know, beat up on Eritrea, but not be so vocal when it comes to Saudi Arabia? Or when it comes to North Korea, why aren't you as vocal on religious freedom abuses as you are on the nuclear issue, that, that sort of thing. And I think we have to maintain a degree of, of, of flexibility given the complexity of, of the issues in, in, in a variety of locations, the, the different kinds of um, relationships and leverage that the US or the UK or any particular country uh, has with um, a nation in which there's some uh, issues of concern. Uh, a few years ago, I worked with some colleagues on a report for the European Parliament on religious freedom conditions uh, outside the EU. And we tried to rate all these countries on a number of, of metrics in terms of governmental and societal respect uh, for religious freedom. But we also tried to measure the leverage that the EU had in those particular countries related to aid or trade or whatever it might be. And that's also a very relevant piece of, of, of the puzzle that we need to, be, need to consider. Courtney. Yeah, I, I completely agree that there need, there's no one size fits all solution given that leverage is not the same everywhere and the relationships are not the same. I do think when it comes to sanctions in particular, um, I, I'm personally a bit skeptical about, about how effective they are. I think if, if they were put in place multilaterally, that's probably more effective than just kind of you know, just from the US or just from the UK. Um, but I, I, think, I think the problem is, is that oftentimes, as, as was mentioned, that these are generational issues that are not, that you know, sanctions cannot change necessarily. And even calling, calling out uh, abuses as genocide. I don't know the extent to which that will change processes on the ground. I mean, a lot of this has to do with, uh, with, with social issues and, and with, with the grassroots uh, thinking. And that's what's much more difficult to change. I mean, regardless of how much leverage uh, you may have over, over a certain country where these abuses are being, um, are being perpetuated. Thank you. Um, I want to come now to a question from uh, Brenda Finnegan Theakston, who's an LSE graduate, uh, because she really um, sort of throws in the, the thorny question here, um, which is that, and, and Courtney, you touched on this, uh, that some religious practices go against uh, what we now consider to be modern democratic freedoms. Um, uh, she suggest gentle mutilation, although in some cases that's that's not considered uh, religious, more cultural, but certainly all the issues you touched on around gender and LGBTQI+. Uh, so Brenda asks, how do our open societies manage to defend the freedom to keep some people less free than others at the same time as honouring our fundamental commitment to the freedom of the person? Who wants to get the ball rolling on that one? So I thought you were asking Courtney that directly. Um, I was waiting for Courtney to answer. Otherwise, I, I... I'll let you start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, I mean, I, I, th I do think that there are two things um, that we have to consider here. So within the United States, we have a certain discussion around what religion means, what religion's role is in the public sphere. Um, and it's, it's a very American discussion. Um, and within that, there are differences of opinion, right? Um, and you don't have a singular American response uh, to many of the questions around, you know, the role of, you know, different religious actors and so on, or, or indeed uh, religious discourse and um, how social values are changing and so on. Uh, you compare that discussion to Canada, it's going to be different. You compare that discussion to the UK, it's going to be different. You compare that, I mean, within, within Europe, we have different arrangements for the establishment of uh, church-state relations that look very different and, and frankly look incredibly backward from an American point of view. 
um, whereas it's not necessarily the same for us. Um, England has an established church. Uh, the rest of the United Kingdom does not, uh, etc. So, you know, the, I think that there are uh, a range of things that we don't necessarily agree on. Um, and I think that that applies not simply to issues of religious freedom, but also simply in relations to, you know, uh, the human rights discussion more generally across the board. Um, and what I found personally, and, uh, and this is something that I've tried to work on, particularly in the past sort of four or five years, is when there is a range of multiple answers to, you know, specific questions, what, where do we find a consensus? And I think we find a consensus in those agreements that we've actually made. So every country has signed up to certain international treaties on you know, these particular fundamental freedoms and these human rights and so on. Um, and I think that that's the, the, the baseline for an international discussion that we can push forward. Um, and where there isn't that baseline, I'm not sure we can take the same point of view. Um, when we're actually engaging with other countries. Uh, and I'm not necessarily interested in trying to do that. I don't want to try to convince countries in the Arab world to become Western liberal democracies. Um, I am interested in them upholding um, treaties and international conventions that they themselves have actually signed up to. They relate to the rule of law, they relate to accountability, they re relate to representative government and so on and so on. OK, um, and I don't need to sort of, you know, knock them over the head with what I think are intrinsically universal, but really they're not intrinsically universal. They're simply what people in my own country in the UK or in, or in the US think are universal. Um, so I think really holding uh, holding that baseline on the basis of uh, consensus international law um, is probably a good way to go. Um, people will say, well, that doesn't go far enough. And, and frankly, as a, pac uh, a practitioner in these areas, um, if we just got that done, I'd be very happy. And I think the world would be a much better place if we could just get that part done. Courtney. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly complicated issue, which is why uh, I didn't want to answer first and let, let Hicham uh, <laughs> give his remarks, which are really useful. Um, but I think it also need to take into account the different contexts are, are different socially and politically. Um, I think that oftentimes when we talk about you know, socially illiberal religious groups, there's only so much power they can have when you have basically when there's this idea of, of kind of draining the swamp of allowing them to have freedom as long as they're not kind of perpetuating violence allowing them to to try to attract voters if they don't attract voters they can't get into power and therefore they can't kind of implement policies which uh hurt a, a lot of segments of the population this is kind of one school of thought that essentially everyone should be allowed to to state their their views religious or otherwise and and kind of see how it plays out. I mean, the problem with this is, is that you're, you're going to end up with some illiberal outcomes. Uh, and, and I think that also it's, it's worth pointing out that even, even when we have elections, even when we have religious freedom and political freedom coexisting, you'll often get outcomes which are not the same as what we would expect in, for instance, a, a Western liberal democracy. So I think Kuwait is a really interesting example whereby um, you know, the elected parliament repeatedly voted against giving women the right to vote. Uh, and it, it was only in 2005 by, by Amiri decree that eventually women did get the right to vote and it, it kept being voted down. Uh, and there was nothing really the US could say because, or anyone could say because this is a liberal, a liberal process, a democratic process. Um, and yet religious uh, policies, I think, and social policies from religious groups in particular did influence the way in which this discussion went about in parliament. Um, so I think it's a really difficult issue because every context is different. Um, every group is different. And, and I think it would be great if everyone could kind of accord with, with international laws, as Hisham mentioned. Um, I don't have, have an answer clearly um, in terms of how do you balance out these concerns for providing space for religious freedom, but at the same time providing uh, freedom for, for everyone else as well uh, to, to kind of practice as, whether, as, as they want to and as, as they choose to. And, and as well as I think the, the Biden administration has done a good job of, of calling out the, the freedom to have no religious belief, which is, I think is something that in the States in the past, we haven't really talked about too much. And, and it's worth worth mentioning as well. Judd, this is a really kind of critical issue for the for the Biden administration, isn't it? Because the State Department's really wanting to champion LGBT rights, women's rights, but put religious freedom alongside that. Um, any any perspective? Yeah, no, it's very 
timely question, and and other, others have thought more much more about it than than I have. But um, I would say I'm I'm grateful that um, President Biden Biden appointed uh, to lead the White House faith based office someone who is a a top church state uh, scholar, Mel Melissa Rogers. The person who sort of filled that role during the Trump era was a prosperity gospel preacher, <laughs> who didn't have uh, near the 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 credentials that. Um, uh, Melissa Rogers brings to that. So I think that's very good that you have uh, advising the government, people who are really attentive to these issues and an expert on them. But the, uh, the, the challenge of living together alongside our deepest theological and ideological differences is, is always going to be present with us. I think uh, you know, liberal democracy does the best job of um, ordering societies that are, that are diverse along ideological and, and theological lines. Uh, but it's always going to be um, going to be a challenge. Thank you. Um, now, the issues don't get any easier. Uh, Deepanshu Singhal, who's a student at Ashoka University in Mumbai, uh, asks about the Israel-Palestine conflict and how the Biden administration uh, is going to approach that and whether religious freedom is... Uh, is going to be instrumental in that. It's, I, I found it very interesting over the last few weeks, and you wrote a little piece myself, uh, about religious freedom as, as perhaps a new perspective on, on trying to unlock something in this very intractable conflict. Hisham, I know you're gonna have something to say. <laughs> ah, am I, uh, is my face so obvious? Okay, so, um, uh, the, you know, we've talked a lot about human rights and how religious freedom, ought to be considered part and parcel of that discourse, which I think is correct. And unfortunately, I just don't see the Biden administration taking that up when it comes to um, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, what we've seen, unfortunately, is a continuation of, frankly, the same tired, tired, tired policies of many years. Um, and the issues have gotten worse. If we're talking about religious freedom, well, you know, literally a few hours ago, not even a few hours ago, in front of the old city of Jerusalem, um, Israeli police um, cleared off a whole section in front of the old city so that, you know, far right uh, extremists could stand in front of one of the old gates of Jerusalem. And we're talking huge numbers of people chanting death to the Arabs. OK, um, protected by Israeli police. So uh, religious freedom um, when the uh, the occupation marches onto the Al-Aqsa uh, Haram compound um, and attacks people in prayer during the, uh, the last nights of Ramadan. Uh, religious freedom. Yeah, I mean, I could really go on. Um, and unfortunately, there's so much evidence that applies when it comes to this particular issue on Israel-Palestine, um, and frankly, it's not talked about uh, as much as it ought to be within particularly a DC context. Um, much more so, I will say, within an, a London context and on, on the continent, but within a DC context, it's been really lacking. Um, I will say that in recent weeks and recent months, that is changing somewhat, and I will say somewhat, um, because I think that the overwhelming uh, direction is still in the other uh, sort of way where, you know, we talk about um, Israel's right to self-defense, um, which has resulted in a massive amount of disproportionate force upon uh, the occupied territories. Uh, but there are voices, I think, that are expressing a great deal of concern about, you know, why aren't we talking about uh, the occupation? Why aren't we calling it an occupation? Why aren't we saying bluntly that these are occupied territories in international law? Um, why, are, why is it so, uh, uh, so much of a scandal to have a page on the New York Times cover um, with dead Palestinian and Israeli children? Why, why, is this, why is this so scandalous? But apparently it is scandalous, um, according to some, unfortunately, actors within the religious freedom arena. Um, uh, such as uh, Abraham Foxman. I mean, uh, I, I'm sorry, but you know, I think we have to be very clear and direct about these sorts of things. Thanks, Hisham. Courtney. I also think that there's a huge conflation in the in the American context of of religion with political position. So that Judaism necessarily is aligned with Zionism, and they're different things. Um, 
and, and I think that's not pointed out enough. I think also I, I would say this is the the area in which language in the U.S. has not really changed much in the past few decades, and and I was hopeful that the Biden administration would would exhibit some kind of change. But you know, when you have around the same time of, of these attacks happening, that the the Biden administration approves, I think it's seven hundred thirty five million dollars worth of of weapons to Israel. Um, the, it's really difficult to to believe that anything will will change and and whether religious freedom is is invoked or not. And I think one one thing that you hear over and over again in the states is this idea that Israel is the, the only democracy in the Middle East. So it's this idea that Israel has some kind of intrinsic value because of its political system when in fact, you know it is occupying territories <laughs> when it, it, it there is it is in fact, you know, a, uh, you know, perpetuating violence against against Palestinians and has done for decades. And so I think that in the US, there, the conversation may be shifting a little bit more on the ground. And I'm a little bit more hopeful there because my friends in the States for the first time are asking questions as to why do we give so much military aid to Israel? Why is this kind of considered one unmoving part of American foreign policy? Um, and, and so I think that is a good sign but I still think the rhetoric at the top is is largely the same, and I don't know whether uh, framing this through a religious freedom perspective would would change anything. I think that oftentimes what you'll hear when people talk about religious freedom, it's it's really fueling support for for Israel or support for this conflation between religious freedom and and support for Israel, which is not which doesn't doesn't make sense uh, in, in my view. Um, so yeah, John, do you? more hopeful about the potential of religious freedom here? Not terribly in this particular case. Uh, I'm, I'm not a, um, don't have the Middle East expertise that uh, Hisham and Courtney have, so I don't have a, a lot to add. I did I did find it was is interesting when the State Department released its religious freedom report uh, last month, that right away Blinken and other officials were peppered with questions about the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict. And I don't know if their comments are something that would be uh, useful in this uh, conversation now, but um, uh, that, that would be another case where um, obviously religion is, is part of it, but if we over-religionize uh, the situation, then that's that's not terribly helpful. And certainly for a lot of those um, uh, on the U.S. side of things, particularly American evangelicals, it's it's entirely a religion-related thing. With the support for Israel, Zionism is uh, is a theological commitment, um, even apocalyptic sort of uh, commitment, um, whereby the the nation of Israel is sacralized. And once you sacralize a country or a politician or a particular issue, it's very hard to work out any sort of compromise because compromise would be, in a sense, going against God's will. Mm. We've got a similar sort of question around um, continuity in American policy from, from Trump to Biden from Father Spencer Cantrell at All, All Saints Church in Brooklyn. Um, he says, Dr. Freer mentioned the Biden administration's religious freedom priorities being quite focused on policing, homeland security, et cetera. Is there space to note a lack of shift in approach from Trump to Biden? I'm thinking also of a lack of a hard rhetorical and structural departure from Trump's refugee migration policies. Is religious freedom only about policing and borders? Courtney, do you want to? Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question. and and. I think it is striking to note the, the continuity between the two. And I think a, a lot of the rhetoric, I think even I argue, I guess, since the Bush era has been, when we talk about religious freedom, we talk about uh, national security. Um, and, I, and I think that's that's problematic. And yeah, I mean, I, I do think that looking at, at some of Biden's other policies in terms of um, you know, trying to talk with civil with with Muslim groups within the U.S., we do see a shift, and I think that having some type of dialogue on the ground with different types of of groups which represent different religious communities in the states would be a, a welcome shift. I don't know the extent to which that's happening. I mean, I do I I do think that that we may see a shift there. I don't know. I know that that President Biden has met with several Muslim groups on the ground. I don't know the extent to which that's happening with other types of groups. Um, but still, I think that there is a, a problem um, in, in the states with regard to seeing certain religions as un-American or as, as more problematic than others. And, and that's why you see a lot of surveilling, in particular, as I mentioned, of, of Muslim communities. And we've seen this with the New York, uh, the, with the NYPD, with Boston police as well. Um, and I'm sure it happens elsewhere. And, and so I think that, that this is a, a, that framing religious freedom as a national security issue is 
is problematic because it is a, a human rights issue more than anything else. And so I don't know whether more, enga- I, I would encourage more engagement with, with groups on the ground uh, to kind of counterbalance this perception that, that religious freedom is just about policing and borders because it, it, it strikes me that it, it does kind of seem to fall in that way. That said, um, I, I do think that the stress on policing makes sense in, in that hate crimes have increased and you have more anti-Semitic attacks in particular, uh, Islamophobic attacks continuing as well. So there, I can see the, the extent to which policing does matter um, in that respect because there has been a lot of violence, um, but, but this is not the only, the only lens through which uh, religious freedom could, it can be or should be viewed. Hmm. Do any of it, Judd? Sure. Yeah, building on what, what Courtney said, I think you'll always have elements of, of continuity uh, as well as uh, elements of discontinuity between uh, administrations, even um, when you have different parties or, or, or the same party. Um, when it comes to religious freedom, a few things that come to mind um, that I've noticed in terms of continuity, the rhetoric about China, I think uh, in the Biden administration is continuing on from the, um, the way in which uh, the Trump administration sort of upped the ante talking about crimes against humanity and genocide against Uyghurs. I think that has uh, continued to pace. And I, and I think quite appropriately, obviously there's a geopolitical uh, contestation going on between the two superpowers, but uh, it's hard to have any other t- appropriate term for what's going on um, with Falun Gong, with the house church, and especially with uh, Uyghurs in, in Western China. Uh, in terms of um, discontinuity, I think for a lot of domestic uh, audiences, particularly evangelicals, religious freedom is uh, the right to have exemptions, uh, exemptions from um, pandemic lockdowns, uh, exemptions um, uh, in terms of the right to hire and fire um, um, within churches and faith-based groups based on on theology and, and, and morality and those sort of things. Um, I think what the Biden administration did, or at least the Biden campaign, um, um, and Courtney alluded to some of these things, um, is they help to sort of broaden and reframe the discussion around religious freedom a bit, also bring in the tolerance piece that it's not just for uh, majority Christians who feel a bit um, you know, beleaguered or marginalized, it's also for uh, Jews and Muslims and others who face real physical uh, violence and challenges in the States, uh, as well as um, um, you know, safety for, for synagogues and other religious sites that, that Courtney referred to. So I think that, that that's an element that was uh, largely missing, at least in emphasis during the during the Trump years, that the Biden folks um, have helped to uh, bring to the fore, um, broadening and reframing the religious freedom discussion. Sure. Um, so just just following on, I mean, in terms of continuity, I think Judd is absolutely right when it comes to China and the Uyghurs. I also agree with him that it's appropriate. Um, but when it comes to um, you know dealing domestically for the Biden administration. Um, uh, th- there, there are two particular, uh, well, one is a structural problem and one is, is frankly a societal problem. On a structural, is, on a structural level, um, taking away all of the uh, sort of uncomfortable questions around uh, uh, church and state within an American context, it's actually very difficult for state institutions to engage um, with representative religious organizations for religious communities that don't admit uh, a hierarchical, ecclesiastical, church-like structure. Um, That applies for Muslims, that applies for many other communities as well. So um, usually when the Biden administration or Downing Street or any, well, not any, but um, many different governments in the West for that matter deal with, and here I'm thinking about Muslim communities, they're not really dealing with representative bodies, they're dealing with lobby groups um, because they can't be representative in that sense. Um, So they deal with as many as they can, as long as they're not going to cause them problems politically and so on. So that's a structural issue that's actually quite difficult, even with the best of intentions to deal with. Um, on, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it is rather difficult. Uh, on a societal level, you know, um, literally a month ago, um, President Biden announced the domination of Zahid Qureshi, uh, a magistrate judge in New, uh, New Jersey uh, uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, he announced him as a nominee for the United States District Court for New Jersey. And that would have made him, and it did make him actually, the first Muslim federal judge in America. In the midst of his nomination hearings, a senator, a sitting senator asked Mr. Qureshi, 
what do you know about Sharia law? I mean, we're in 2021 and somebody is being asked the modern equivalent of, you know, the, the popular last century version of asking a Catholic politician on the verge of taking public office, whether or not he or she will pledge loyalty to the Pope or to the American Constitution, you know? And that's literally a month ago. So, you know, it's a societal problem um, that I think is, uh, is one that will be with us for quite some time, um, not simply in the United States, but, but elsewhere as well. Bit of a Washington question here from Joshua Hughes, who's at King's College London. Tony Blinken, US Secretary of State, announced in March that he was dismantling the Commission on Unalienable Rights set up by his predecessor, Mike Pompeo, to promote religious freedom worldwide. What signal does that send to domestic and international stakeholders and what implications might it have for policymakers? George, that sounds like your ballpark. <laughs> I can address it, but also want to hear from Hisham and Courtney if they want to speak into that. Um, I mean, I think that was a good move by, by Blinken and one that was uh, pretty much inevitable given how much of a Trump and Pompeo um, uh, sort of print there was on, on that commission. Um, the commission did have, have some really serious scholars on it, um, but overall, what they did was provide some scholarly heft, basically, for this idea of a hierarchy of human rights, that religious freedom really is uh, the, the first freedom and thus needs to be prioritized uh, above all others. And so it's not surprising at all that uh, that commission was, was scrapped and um, that there's this rhetoric around co-equal, inter interdependent, indivisible rights. Um, that's largely been welcomed by um, the human rights community. Um, and I, I would say too that, um, I don't know if I addressed this um, sufficiently in my remarks, but um, within the activist community on, on religious freedom, uh, there's um, quite a bit of, of um, sort of agreement about religious freedom for all people everywhere, uh, that religious freedom is one of many human rights. You'll have some that are a bit more on the margins in terms of um, it's the first freedom or we need to prioritize Christians or whatever it might be. But um, in the main, you have um, a, a broad consensus that it's, it's one of many important human rights and it needs to be for all people everywhere. Others want to come in? Uh, Courtney, would you like to go first? Go okay. ahead. Um, so um, uh, first, I don't think that that commission was set up to promote religious freedom worldwide. Um, I think it was an incredibly partisan, extremely politicized commission, as Judd's pointed out. Um, and I frankly didn't even know that uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken announced that it was being dismantled, because I think, frankly, it ended. And it ended long before he came into office. And, you know, I don't think anybody really took it particularly seriously. Um, it, uh, it, was, it was known to be the Pompeo Commission. And frankly, and I hope I'm not sort of giving away too much inside baseball here, but um, from what I understood in DC was that it was simply a signal to certain parts of uh, particular religious communities in the United States to say, see, we've, we've given you something that you wanted. Um, and that made it even less relevant in terms of wider conversations around what are frankly interesting questions, you know, the, you know, natural law and human rights discourses. And so, I mean, those are actually interesting academic questions to, uh, to, to sort of pose and engage on, uh, but, but this definitely not. And I don't think it was ever going to be taken seriously, quite frankly. So I don't think it sends a signal anywhere. I don't think it sends a single domestically. I don't think it sends a signal internationally, because I don't frankly think anybody took too much notice of it in the first place. Courtney, did you, did you want to come in? Yeah, I just, I, I agree. I think it was, was primarily a, a partisan plea and it was a play to the domestic evangelical audience more than, than any, I, I think, a sincere attempt at, at at protecting religious freedom. Um, that may be cynical, but I, I'm, I'm also not surprised that it was dismantled after the, the Trump era. Interesting question here from Alex Bazazi from Italy, who just asked, what about Russia? And perhaps <laughs> broadening slightly uh, to kind of questions of, of foreign policy and religion. I think the, the link between the Trump administration and, and and Russia was clearly a very complex one, but religion did seem to be in the mix and 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 Russia as a country which 
had kind of newly won religious freedom in the last few decades and uh, and and uh, with a very resurgent church and so forth. So Biden is meeting President Putin, I believe this week. Is, um, is, is religion gonna play a part in that relationship and what implications might it have for, for religious freedom? I don't know if we have any Russia specialists here, but it might be unfair to put to you, but if anyone has any thoughts, Hisham. Um, only because it's it's something that I, I looked at on, on particular part of that discussion anyway. So um, uh, Russia has a very interesting relationship with religion, as I'm sure you know, Jim. Um, you know, the symbolism of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, the split within that church um, over the last century and so on, um, and actually with minority religions as well. Um, so there's, there's actually a very curious relationship between the the overall idea of what Russia is and what Russia isn't, and also its relationship with orthodoxy um, and Islam, you know, very curiously. Um, it's a much longer conversation to go into, but it means that you, you actually have... Um, one of uh, Putin's main ideologues, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, uh, but speak extremely favorably about Islam as a source of traditional values in a world um, that is, you know, postmodernist. And so it, his name escapes me. But um, uh, what what I found very ironic is that he was also cited very positively by Steve Bannon, who seemed to not realize that one of his main influences came from a man who actually had very nice things to say about Islam and Muslims. Um, uh, his name just escapes me right now. So it's Alexander something, but I'm uh, Dukin, du, du, something, du, uh, Alexander Dukin, I think it was, or Dutin. Um, so in any case, the uh, but none of that, I think, is going to be a discussion between uh, DC um, and Moscow. Uh, I don't think that that's really going to be um, a subject of conversation. I could be wrong, but I've not seen that come up at all. Uh, particularly when you consider that, uh, at least from the Russian side, they've built uh, a lot of relationships within uh, the heartland of the Muslim world, within you know uh, Arab states and so on. Um, and you know, religion doesn't really come into it. Um, even when you consider Russia's support for Bashar al-Assad, it's it's not considered as you know uh, Russia taking on the anti-Islam kind of agenda or something. Uh, and that's the same, I think, in other parts of the world as well. So I don't, I don't imagine that it's going to be uh, a hugely significant portion of that discussion when they meet. Dugan, that's it. D U G I N. Any others want to come in? Um, I'm not a, not a Russia specialist, but certainly U.S. Russia relations were really, really weird the past four years with uh, Trump's inability to to criticize. Um, uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin and his seeming uh, credulity towards uh, what Putin told him about um, election interference and, and so many other things. And also along with that, uh, a number of uh, American domestic audiences um, suddenly becoming quite pro-Russian and talking about Russia as defender of Christianity, defender of traditional morality, uh, when Russia is a um, you know, deeply problematic authoritarian state that persecutes uh, Muslim minorities, persecutes Jehovah's Witnesses, certainly under the guise of extremism laws, uh, actually persecutes a number of uh, evangelical and, and Pentecostal groups. Um, um, or at least uh, you know, represses their, their activity. So I, I hope um, this will be a, a sensible reset in US-Russian relations where you know, as appropriate religion and religious freedom issues are, are raised because they're, they're serious issues in Russia. Hmm. Courtney, you're good. Well, we're coming into our last few minutes. So I want to um, close with this last question from Bill Lowe, who is with Christian Solidarity Worldwide. And he asks, and I think we'll put this to all the panelists, what one step would you like to see the Biden administration take to advance freedom of religion or belief slash religious freedom in all parts of the world? One step. Someone has to go first. 
that, that, that's a great question. I'm trying to think if I have uh, one thing. I mean, again, we've, we've talked this evening about how complex and, and interconnected all these issues are. I'm trying to think if the, I, I, there probably isn't one particular step or silver bullet that's going to do it. Um, I should also acknowledge that I serve on the board of uh, Christian Solidarity uh, USA um, and uh, value the, the, the work that they do, promoting religious freedom for all people everywhere. Um, so maybe come back to me in a minute once I've thought of something, uh, if something pops into my mind, but I'm curious um, how Hisham and Courtney would go about um, answering that question. Oh, oh go ahead. Or, cool. I, I guess, I mean, it's a great question. I, I guess the, the one thing that I think would be useful moving forward is actually uh, putting some weight behind this idea that religious freedom and political freedoms need to go kind of hand in hand and this idea that human rights matter across the board and 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 being and ser having serious conversations with a lot of authoritarian partners that the US has about the way in which they treat not only religious minorities but other minorities as well and basically folding in freedom of, of religious belief into into broader discussions about anti-authoritarianism and and the way in which you know the US supports or doesn't support certain types of regimes um, so i think really putting putting some action behind this idea that uh, you know, religious freedom is part of a, a broader human rights agenda that the U.S. is hoping to to push moving forward. So this is what happens when you go last. Somebody else has already made the point that you wanted to make. So thank you, Courtney. You know, um, uh, so I, I now get to make two points. So I'd like to repeat what Courtney said and say that I uh, I support that one hundred percent. I'd also say that um, again, going back to this flexibility point, uh, very often. Very and, and very often for you know out of uh, great intentions and well-meaning um, sort of ideas, we find policymakers trying to intervene on particular issues in particular countries, religious freedom ones as well, without rooting their discussions in discussions that are happening in country by people who will be affected by those interventions the most. Okay, um, I remember this really clearly in the early years of the Arab uprisings. Um, and it was very unfortunate because you had people, even well-meaning people back in D.C. or in London, uh, wanting to push for X or Y. And, you know, people on the ground saying, please don't do that. Don't do that. You're actually making our lives a lot more difficult. So I would uh, urge uh, not not some of the administration, but all of us to root our considerations um, about what is going on in different countries around the world in the discussions of people who are on the ground um, who have been looking at these issues the, uh, the most and who will be affected the most. They're the ones with skin in the game. They're the ones that are going to be affected or impacted the most or them and their families and their friends. It will very rarely be those people outside who are making the most noise. George, quickly. Yes, um, totally endorse what, uh, what Courtney and, and Hisham have just said. I, I would just say, um, looking domestically in, in the United States, I think what, what could be most impactful, and I think it's something that's already underway, and that is rebuilding the credibility of the United States on this issue, making sure there's coherence between our domestic practice and our foreign policy uh, rhetoric and actions. And your promotion of any value, including religious freedom, is a lot more compelling when you have a good story to tell about what's going on inside your own country. I think that's a great uh, contributions to, to end on. I think we've really gone um, deep into these issues tonight. So I, I just want to thank all our panelists for contributing, for giving us their time this evening, and to our whole audience uh, from around the world uh, for joining us today. I hope we've made some contribution to deepening our understanding of this important aspect of human freedom. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim.